Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're back again today with another exciting podcast. Someday we, we have somebody really exciting today because uh, she studies uh, microbes and all kinds of fun stuff everywhere on earth. She's really, really smart person. We've got Dr. Karen Lloyd, microbiologist from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Hi, Karen. Hi. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> she's not quite professor, but she's going to be maybe an associate professor <laughs> soon. No, I'm I'm an associate professor now. That just means that I have tenure. Oh, You're an associate ah, professor when okay. You have tenure. Yeah, the right. the names are kind of obscure. People don't really know what they mean. It's like on my card, but yeah. don't really care. But doctor means I'm I'm in business. I'm for real, and we I guess. we love to have the doctors on here. Um, so you study microbes, like all kinds of different surfaces and and places in the world that they're found. Um, are there anywhere, is there anywhere on earth that they don't live? So I would say that we have never found a place on earth that we for sure can say that they don't live, uh -huh. which is kind of a crazy thing to say because earth is quite big. Um, for a while, people thought that the Atacama Desert in Chile was devoid of all life just because it was really hard to get anything there. But now um, that's been shown to be incorrect. There's actually plenty of microbial life in the Atacama Desert. Um, uh, and what kind are they? Are they are they interesting? Are they unique to that area? Um, yes and no. It sort of depends on what level you look at. You know, if you look at pretty high taxonomic levels like phyla, you know, something that's, you know, like a base level group, they're going to, you'll find things from that same phylum, for instance, in a lot of different places. But on the species level or the strain level, yeah, you definitely see local differences in different places. Interesting. Because I always think uh, instances like Madagascar, they got um, kind of broke away from the rest of the world. Uh, life evolved in this different way. I would think uh, microbes maybe would do the same. Are, are a lot of them ancient? Like anciently old? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you mean their lineage or do you mean their individuals, their bodies? No, like their lineage, not their life cycles. Okay. Both of those are old compared to what we normally think about. Ah, so they've been around longer than us. Which one? The the lineage? Yeah. The, the microbes themselves, have they been around? Oh, the microbes themselves. Yeah. Um, there is a very good chance that there are individual microbes that live for thousands of years or longer. Ah, so... Did we branch off at some point to, obviously we started mm -hmm. as some kind of single cell organism. For sure. Did yeah. some of these single cell organisms say, okay, you go ahead and evolve. We're going to stay here. No, I think they've been continuing to evolve. I mean, that's, we have this weird notion that humans are somehow like more evolved than, than the, like, <laughs> I would we're say not that. more evolved. <laughs> Do you know what? The only thing we breathe is oxygen. That's the only thing we breathe. We are so behind these microbes. <laughs> they can breathe CO2, hydrogen, iron, vanadium, magnesium, copper. Uh, think of more selenium, uranium, wow. radioactive uranium. They can live off of just the radiation alone and how it reacts with water. They can live off of just put some water and a certain type of rock in one environment. And then you can have life flourishing and you know, we're just dependent on oxygen. That's so, what we do. And, so and we can't even, we can't even do the oxygen part by ourselves either. Cause do you remember from biology class, the mitochondria that are inside our cells, uh -huh. the powerhouses of the cell? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I had to make like a fabric poster when I was a kid and I remember cutting out little bean shaped mitochondria, but mitochondria that make, that process all our oxygen for us and make all our energy. Those are microbes. Not yeah. It, not anymore, but they were microbes. So we can trace them back to their origins as a proteobacteria. Wow. That's incredible. And now they just live in us. Yeah. So can you get, maybe you're like, like probiotics say, oh, I don't have enough. Can you go get some mitochondria, maybe inhale them and, ha and have them help you with? <laughs> no, they're not reliving anymore. They're only our organelles. Whoa. So they've, they've, They've um, cast their lives with us. You know, they are no longer a separate microbe. They are us. They're human, but they're not human. It's, man, the lines blurry. are not very clear. <laughs> very, very blurry. These lines. I love that. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, they grew up, they told you. Oh, well, they, you got good microbes and you got bad microbes. And the good ones help us uh, do stuff like digest and stuff. But yeah. it, the more you learn, the more insanely clear it is. 
Um, but yeah, I wouldn't call humans more evolved seeing that the kind of political situations we get ourselves into. And, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we're not so smart. But also we're by polluting and creating all this stuff, we're, we're kind of poisoning ourselves, but we're delivering to the microbes like all these alternate w- things to breathe like they're fine with. They can CO2, yeah. they go, hey, no problem. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I'm studying these microbes up in permafrost and they're like, sweet. We get more liquid water for longer parts of the year. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Do you do you anthropomorphize uh, these um, things sometimes? Draw little yeah, just eyeballs on them, and it helps when you're talking to people who don't think about microbes every day. Um, just because it's it's not like yeah, if you're just not used to thinking about them, it's easier to talk about them like they're little people. But when you're looking under the electron microscope, do you say, "Oh, there's Gary and there's Todd"? <laughs> No, not to that level. <laughs> that would be really slow. There's billions of them. Oh, yeah. You could name them all. Yeah. Um, well, it takes me to my next question. There are actually good microbes and bad microbes. Um, that line is blurry, too. Yeah. Um, a lot of them have symbiotic relationships with us, and some of them uh, can attack us and make us sick. Uh, what are some examples of each? Yeah. So it's that the, I say the line is blurry because there's a lot of commensal things that just live on our skin and, you know, they maybe even help us because they keep other microbes from growing. So, you know, they're good. We like them. But then when we get a cut and they get on the inside of our bodies, then they can cause sepsis and make us die. Mm. Interesting. So is that a good microbe or a bad microbe? In moderation, just like my, gin, yeah, exactly. just like my gin and tonic in moderation. Just like your gin and tonic. That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> So in stuff like E. coli that exists naturally in in places on food, just pretty much on all kind of surfaces in some degree. Have you studied E. coli a bit? No, I don't. I don't study a lot of the kind of normal microbes. I study the weird ones. Ah, the exotic microbes. Yes, exactly. Cool. They do the bossa nova. Um, Yeah, the ones in Latin America do for sure. Yeah. Well, I'll just tell you shortly. I went to Mexico and I happened to scoop up a few hitchhikers uh, microbe. Uh, they wanted to be in my oh, no. live in my body for a while. And, what did you uh, get? I got amoebas, uh-huh. and I did get E. coli at the same time. And oh, I, I was even skinnier than I am now, and uh, it was it was hilarious. I was <laughs> I was really sick, yeah, for weeks. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, they're really bad. There's one um, deeper. So there's like three major branches of the tree of life. Do you know that? No. The bacteria, the eukaryotes, and the archaea. Okay. So archaea and bacteria are what we think of as microbes usually. Although one of the ones that you just got, amoebic dysentery, is actually a eukaryote. So that's our branch. We're the eukaryotes with the like well-defined organelles and all that stuff. Um, wow. But so you, you were attacked by a bacterium and a eukaryote, but you were not attacked. I can guarantee you, you were not attacked by that third branch of life because as far as we know, and this is still kind of a big mystery, there are no pathogens, no human pathogens in that entire branch a third of the whole tree of life just doesn't take advantage of us at all. And what They're does, what do they include? Is there, wh- wh- who's in that group? Methanogens. So like all of the methane producing microbes that we talk about, you know, we talk about cows that make methane. Uh-huh. So they make methane because there are these archaea that live inside their gut and make methane. Ah, and so, so they're actually quite normal microbes. And if we ingest on accident, some of these microbes, we're fine. They just come in and out. Oh, you already have them. Yeah. We uh, almost always, Methane. So they're part of our team. Uh, well, like I said, it's blurry. Allies. You know, a lot of the things that allies. I mean, every almost any bacterium that lives in your body and doesn't hurt you could hurt you if it gets in the wrong place. Okay, all right, but not Sounds the archaea. Right. Same with the wa- archaea. Will do it. Same mm-hmm. with water. If you if water is good for you, you drink too much, you could be in a lot of trouble. Right. That's uh, right. I like talking to you. You're so much fun. Um, Ah, uh, so with all the stuff that you could possibly study, there's so elephants and all these wonderful things on Earth. Uh, what led you to study these unsung microscopic heroes, these microbes? I just am, I love the idea that they're like hidden in plain sight. They're everywhere, all the time, doing all these crazy things, and they just like. I don't know. They're so cool. They kind of don't care about us per se, Mm -hmm. and they just kind of do their own thing. So they're powerful. I like them because they're powerful. What what was the first time that you, um, that you 
came to this conclusion? Did you see a documentary as a kid or you thought, well, there's a whole world down there? No. I did a, a summer program for high school students for high school dorks, and um, <laughs> which I embraced. <laughs> it was at uh, North Carolina Central University, which is an HBCU in North Carolina. And I just remember um, there was a uh, graduate student, Jeff, and I cannot remember his last name, but he was just um, enamored of microbes and his, his excitement about the microbial world was just infectious. I just, you know, you'd listen to him talk about it and say like, oh my God, there's this hidden world out there I didn't know about. So that was like when I was 15 or something, I just sort of in the back of my head was like, okay, well, that's that's going to be worth spending my time working on. <laughs> I noticed that a lot of these things happen early in life where something just clicks and you go, wow, this is important. This is cool yeah. and this is important. Yeah. So are you the type that walks around uh, or do you, do you do it kind of bring your work home with you? Do you brew your own wine? Do you do stuff like that? Or do you walk around with hand sanitizer going they're everywhere? <laughs> yeah. yeah, neither. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just not a very DIY person. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I don't, I don't ferment things on my own, but <laughs> <laughs> not that you know of. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Cause mm. I'm fermenting things in my gut right now. There you go. There's comes <laughs> the science. Um, well, that's okay. Uh, I do a bit of, I like to make mushrooms in my back room. I do oyster mushrooms and I do wine. Oh, yeah. It's just They're fun. So I'm, a yeah. si I'm a science fan on my own. I'm not yeah. an academic, but. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they all kind of look the same if you talk to people that don't know. They, they, yeah. they seem like. Uh, if you can they, see them at all. Yeah, they all look like boogers uh, moving under the yeah. microscope. Um, yeah. can you tell the difference between stuff like microbes or like bacteria and viruses? Can you explain kind of what the difference is between these? I mean, we can use size to some extent, you know, okay. viruses are almost always going to be smaller than a bacterium and a bacterium is almost always going to be smaller than a eukaryote, hmm. but not always there's exceptions to that. So you absolutely cannot say that those are rules. There are bacteria that are as bi big enough where a single cell can be seen with your eye. Um, and then there are some viruses that are as big as the smallest bacteria. And then there are some eukaryotes called pico eukaryotes that are as tiny as bacteria. So they break all the rules. Wow. And so what's the smallest um, thing that we found? Living thing? Sure. Yeah. Or not like living thing. and non-living. Yeah. You mean like a subatomic particle? <laughs> if I, I, even humans are things to some degree. But no, yeah. like anything living... Um, but also, yeah, non-living, like a piece of limestone or whatever. What's the smallest thing that you can find with the, with what you're doing? You mean with with my measurement techniques, like right? Not with the technology that you have, not having a large hadron collider at my disposal. Is that allow you to look closer at stuff? Well, that's not my domain. We oh. use the advanced photon source. So if you, if you want to talk about like um, accelerators. Yeah, let me, get in, let me get into a subject I have no, no idea about. And I'll just pretend like I know. <laughs> awesome. Same for me. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, just, you know, the technology in order to study these things, you got to have at least a magnifying glass. Um, what's the... Oh, oh, I see the assumption you're making that we use a lot of, of visual imagery. Yeah. We yeah. just don't. Oh. We just don't do it. It's a feeling. Just, You're just feeling around like a like a <laughs> yeah. raccoon. I just have tarot cards, and they tell me what the micro. <laughs> Science is um, going to shit. Oh. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. We didn't have funding, but um, <laughs> it's uh, um, we use a lot of biomolecules, so we do a lot of things that look like chemistry. Oh. So we look at chemicals that are present inside these cells. And it ends up being biology because the chemicals that we're looking at are biological molecules. So we look at chemicals like DNA and RNA <clears throat> and small metabolites that are intermediates in metabolism. And we look at proteins and we look at lipids. And from all these things, we can piece together what the cells are doing and how they're functioning. Then we use geology to put them in the right setting and figure out how they're interacting. So to, and then to, to get it down to even more uh, of a level, like, so you test the pH of something, test the chemistry. Mm -hmm. There's different, there's different tests in science to test the chemistry of substances. And like yeah, P, a pH, a pH thing or a, um, yeah, that's interesting. Maybe yeah, I should go, maybe I should go to school. <laughs> 
Well, can, I actually majored in, in biochemistry in undergrad. And so that's, I still feel like what I'm doing is actually chemistry, but it's in the service of answering biological questions. Ah, yeah. I always get this, the, the test tubes and beakers in my mind and I, there's nothing really else there. A few scales, mm. a few shakers in the lab. I don't know. My wife comes Do home. She tells me things. I, I don't know what happens down there. Do you know about like shooting light at things and watching how it bounces off and learning about the thing? No. What does that, what <laughs> does that tell you? A lot of things. It depends on what kind of light you shoot at it, what kind of molecule you have and how it bounces off and how you detect it when it bounces off. And that general field of detection is called spectroscopy. Ooh, I like that. Ooh, that's cool. So every kind of thing on the periodic table or every living thing would have some kind of reflectivity to tell you something. If yeah. It, if it, oh, it's got some sparkly bits in there. Right. Yeah. Well, we can also add sparkly bits. So we do a lot. We actually use sparkles all the time in our chemistry. So when you, I is it, you call it that. <laughs> yeah. But, but like bioengineering, I hear they take gold flakes and like punch it into stuff. Oh yeah. Is that? Yeah. I mean the gold, oh. often you have to play, you're probably talking about atomic force microscopy. I don't know. That's sure. kind of great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. But, I mean, there's, I mean, it's kind of like, it's just such a general question. Like, how do you use chemical technique to detect things? It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I don't know. Do you want to talk about the swimming pool? Like, where do you want to start? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's this, just a bunch of different things. This is a, 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 explain it to me like I'm a five a kind of situation. Um, well, probably, probably the most um, common technique that we use is DNA sequencing. So just like looking at the sequence of DNA, which, you know, there's four bases of DNA, A, G, C, and T. And so the chemistry is pretty straightforward. And we have a lot of enzymes that can make copies of it. And as they make copies, we can add, you know, the sparkly ones or not. So we can add fluorescent nucleotides. And then that can tell us, basically, we can use a, a light detector to say, okay, this nucleotide has been added. Next one's an A, next one's an A, next one's an A. Now we've got a G, now a T, now a C. And we can do this over billions and billions of base pairs. And then we get, um, you know, just these massive files and then we can process them and find out what kind of DNA these guys have. So as far as DNA, they, like you said, it has a certain amount of sequences, like the humans have a certain amount. Uh, do they differ a lot between microbes and animals and people and mushrooms and stuff like that? It depends. It depends on what part of the genome you're looking at. So there are parts. So if you imagine all, all of our genomes as a circle, which is an approximation, but let's just do that for the sake of argument. Um, then you can imagine like little like sections of it that are the same between or similar enough that you could tell that they originally came from the same thing mm -hmm. between us and mushrooms and chimpanzees and bacteria and viruses and all these, all these guys. So you can, you can see that we all came from the same stuff. Actually, Viruses, not always, but definitely the archaea and the bacteria. And then the parts in between that are more the, the parts that make us us. Interesting. And they're different. So we have a lot of similar building blocks and everything, just in a different ratio. Exactly. In different orders. I'm not so stupid after all. Yeah. No, you got it. You got it. <laughs> all right. Um, so we all get hungry sometimes, need a little fuel in our tank. Um, do microbes eat? stuff and do yeah. they leave behind yeah. what they call a, a byproduct yeah everything needs to eat and everything makes waste so we haven't discovered a thing that does not do that yet um and then saying what they eat and what they produce is just um it's a whole lot of things many many different things hmm. so it's hard to say like what they could you know i couldn't name a particular chemical uh, -huh. uh did you hear about this thing that apparently doesn't have a backside it's the, the, uh, it doesn't make, uh, well, apparently it doesn't have a, a butthole, uh, but it's a, it's a microbe that doesn't, um, it's, I don't know, look it up. I know. I just heard it on science Friday. Um, thought it was interesting, uh, but apparently it's the well, only, you were it. she's just on there. Could have been, Sorry. it could have been, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, for everybody listening, just go look it up and let me know if I'm right. Um, Wait, let's, can we go back to this? Do you know more about this? Um, anus free microbe well i think it was um because nothing actually have anuses i don't know if it was the size of a tardigrade or whatever but it was uh, a living thing obviously it wasn't an animal or anything it was it was mm -hmm. microscopic is what i understood mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and it didn't. What the lady says is it didn't have a a butthole, basically, or it didn't have a, a thing to do. And so they couldn't figure out how it excreted waste. Mm. Does that sound familiar at all? Yeah, I mean, it sounds too familiar. Like no microbe would have that. And microscopic ants, I know a lot that don't. Like cypunculids only have one way in and out and they take their whole gut and they shoot it out of their mouths and they can their stomachs and then pull their stomachs with their prey inside it back inside, which is disgusting. But <laughs> animals are crazy. There's also deep sea worms in hydrothermal vents, which are six feet long, like massive, huge worms. And they don't have a gut at all. They don't have mouths. They don't have an anus. They mm. don't have a digestive system. Instead, they're just full of bacteria. And the bacteria use chemistry. They use chemicals from the deep earth and convert it into food for the for the worm. But it, but but they all excrete, do they not? They always have to make something. So often it's like carbon dioxide is like a common um, product that you excrete. There's some chemical you produce. Dang. Well, we've got to tell them to stop because we don't need any more of those CO2. Hold off. Yeah, plenty. Microbes ruining the world. Some of them are. Yeah. Uh, are there? Are there really some? I mean, they are not, like I said, they don't care, right? So, mm. you know, some of them make greenhouse gases. Some of them take them up. Will we see an influx with climate change? Will we see an influx of weird new patches of microbes? Yeah, I mean, definitely. It will definitely shift. That's for sure. It is shifting currently. Mm -hmm. Um, But exactly how that spins out is like um, a huge game of chess. It's like after somebody makes their first move in chess saying how the board's going to look when they're done. Sure, sure. And this is especially with climate changes. There's so many variables that go into modeling and stuff that they can model all they want. But the the chances are I'm thinking it's going to be worse than, uh, than it really is. Yeah, well, that's what happened with sea ice, with the IPCC predictions. It was worse than they thought. Cue the gin and tonic. I know. Sometimes that's all you can do. Yeah, I'm doing a combination of that and trying to be more self-sustaining. I recommend everybody else out there try to do the same. Try to get smart. I think it's important just to it's important just to not be negative, you know, and not to be like, oh, we can't do anything. Like we can always do something. Like holding big companies' feet to the fire, I think, is a is a good thing to do. I like when the it, way yeah. you said that. <laughs> <laughs> hold them, hold their head in the fire, see what happens. Uh, I say we bring back the guillotine, but that's another topic. So. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so we're doing pretty good. Twenty minutes in. I wanted to ask you about uh, your traveling because you traveled a bit with free research. I travel a little bit. Traveling is incredibly fun. You learn all kinds of fun new stuff. Uh, What are some of the more exciting and beautiful places you've been? Um, I have been to the Andes, the high Andes um, in Argentina and Chile. And it's just gut-wrenchingly beautiful. And um, inside volcanoes, is like every volcano I go in is like another world for different reasons. Um, <clears throat> I went in um, uh, Irapetunku volcano in Chile. It's like right on the border of Chile and Bolivia. And the gases were like the maw of hell just like coming up. And um, we had, uh, we all had respirators, but we discovered that half of our res- respirators were shitty and the other half were not. And I had on one of the shitty ones. And so when I oh, went man. to the crater, I was like, <coughs> and I'm like running out. I had to run out screaming. <laughs> like it's not falling from my face. So, <laughs> so then I borrowed from a colleague. And, and this is different than smoke, right? This is what sulfur and what is what's it's, all in there? It's a ridiculous mix of nasty toxic gases streaming out of the earth. So like one of them is like um, uh, fluoric acid, HF which is the stuff in Breaking Bad that he uses to dissolve a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Karen Lloyd, fan of Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't make it past season one. It was too violent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to look that up. Um, and then what else? What else is in the volcano? You shouldn't be um, going in there, by the way. It's, it's dangerous. Yeah, it's true. Um, but there, these ones are, yeah, there's sort of different, I mean, there's many different types of volcanoes. And um uh, but we have to go in them if we want to get samples from them, if we want to know what's going on. And, and I just want to be clear because, you know, you guys don't know my context, but I don't just go in volcanoes. I'm always with 
the people who monitor volcanoes in the country that I'm in, I go as, as an invited guest of people who have authority to go inside volcanoes. Um, I don't want people to think um, that that's something you should just up and do. Yeah. Um, no, we don't need amateur volcano spelunkers. Um, death, death seekers. Yeah. Um, do, do, they, but my, do they tell you before if it's going to erupt? Do they, can they tell before a volcano is going to blow up and nobody, so they keep you safe? Nobody knows when volcanoes are going to erupt. But it is true that sometimes they'll, so basically, okay, the Andean volcanoes are not, um, the ones that I went in are active, like they're going to erupt sometime in the next 500,000 years. So that's, that's a pretty good bet. Um, the Costa Rican volcanoes, they erupt far more frequently. Um, they're very, very frequently erupting. Um, so that's one where we monitor the gases coming out of them and we look and see if it's, Looking. So there was, um, when I went inside Poes Volcano, um, we were thinking of going inside Turrialba, but Turrialba was smoking at the time. And a smoking volcano is not one that you want to go in with a lot of smoke. I mean, they're always smoking a little bit. But. Yeah. Smoking is hazardous to your health, kids. Don't, That's right. don't do it. That's right. Um, it's not good for volcanoes either. Um, oh. Have you been to Vesuvius? Um, oh, just as a tourist. Oh, well, I, I didn't go up in Vesuvius. Actually, Stromboli is erupting right now. It's kind of beautiful. There's, yeah. there's beautiful eruptions happening all over the world. So as, you're a microbiologist, but somehow you've become like kind of a volcano expert from dealing with all these volcanoes. But do you look for microbes specifically in volcanoes or, or you also do the, the bottom point. of the ocean too, right? Yeah, I know. Well, that was originally what I did with the bottom of the ocean, but I've, I'm kind of coming back to that now. Um, I, maybe I'm a little weird because most scientists tend to spe spe like get specific for one environment. And my environment that I'm into is inside earth. So mm. If I have an opportunity to find a way to get stuff coming out of the earth, then I find a way to, to go to it and to start a project there. Um, so that's what's taken me to such different places. But um, the thing with volcanoes is that it's not just the volcano itself. It's the fact that that magma chamber is coming up underneath the earth creates all these like heat circulation gradients where all the groundwater gets infused with all these gases that are coming out of the deep earth. And so this fuels deep microbial ecosystems. And then we get these natural sampling port ports with hot springs and they come shooting back out for, for free. You know, if to drill a borehole costs like millions of dollars and I, and also like the regulation, I, I couldn't afford to do that everywhere, but I can afford to drive up to a hot spring and sample it and take, take samples that come up for free that are flushed out of the deep earth. That is so neat. Is there, yeah. and there's geothermal <laughs> energy possibilities there, is there not? I mean, you a lot of people are using geothermal um, power. Costa Rica has almost entirely geothermal power. Um, so they are, with the exception of what they put in their cars, I think they are fully free from fossil fuels right now. Wow. And they say the dream of green energy is dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Who says that? <laughs> people. Pund pundits, wags. I don't know. I, I always like to, the negative comments, I always like to know who's saying it and why are they saying it? You it, know, that's, that's always my question. Who's yeah, saying it? You cannot be on the internet these days. You just don't go on a place where people are talking in a discussions or comment section because you're well, just, you're going to be sorely disappointed. <laughs> oh, I only talk to people who have names. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know how many people are real or if I'm just been arguing with bots the last yeah. 10 years. You, you could, you could have been arguing with bots. I mean, people or, or people who want to be, you know, yeah. body. Yeah. I, I've had some people on that have confirmed the fact that they are manufacturing consensus with fake discussions coming from fake people and yeah. it's, and it's working really well. For sure. People yeah. are so triggered. <laughs> Uh, I'll have you back. We're going to discuss that again because I mean, <laughs> yeah. at times like these, all, all I can really do is keep trying to interview people who know what they're talking about and try to spread the word of science. I don't want to go back in time. I want to go forward in time. And yeah. So this is what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, it's good you're doing it. Yeah. Well, I thank you for coming by. We did yeah. 30 minutes. I don't want to keep Sweet. you, but I will bother you again. You come back. Are you working yeah. on anything fun in the uh, in the future? Do you have any plans? 
Yeah, I'm headed to probably Argentina in February to go yet again and get nosebleeds up in the Andes <laughs> and suck on oxygen bottles and <laughs> try to sample these volcanoes um, in a separate section. Where do you fly into? Uh, that's future me. I don't know. Somewhere uh, in the south. No. Like, <laughs> Not my department. No. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's going to be fun. That high altitude will get you. I know. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. yeah, make you crazy. But I'm happy to chat with you again. This has been super fun. Yeah, I'll try to make it easy. Relatively painless. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll wave goodbye to everybody at home. Goodbye.